So has everybody found their place in Leviticus 19? And as we look at Leviticus 17 through 20, um, we see that the Lord here is, um, is revealing some holy standards as he's given his law. And so I just want to catch us up for a minute. And so as we think about the law of God, what it is, I just want to read you this. The law of God is the revelation and reflection of God's holy nature. To read his law confronts us with his will and mind. And so God's authority rests on no other source but himself. And interesting to note, as we pointed out Sunday, I am the Lord your God occurs nearly 50 times in chapters 18 through 20. And so there were three holy standards that I believe that God reveals in these three chapters. And the first one was his holy standard of worship. And in that first, in that first chapter 17, God is laying down laws regarding sacrifices. It has to do with worshiping him. And he's giving very specific laws there to emphasize that we too are to be committed to worshiping his holy name. And so we remember that he, that the sacrifices all pointed to Christ. And so he gave laws as far as shedding blood and not eating blood because all of that pointed to Christ Jesus. And it reminds us that the Lord himself is worthy of worship. So we saw his holy standard of worship. The second standard that we saw was in chapters 18 and 20, where God revealed his holy standard of sexual purity. So chapter 18 is a condemnation largely of many sexual, sexual sins. And so I want to I read this, what I shared on Sunday morning, to give us the context as we think about God's holy standard of sexual purity. And it's this, the Bible is clear that sexual love and activity is to, between, is to be between a man and a woman only within the confines of marriage. God laid that down in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. All other biblical teaching regarding sexual purity affirms and underscores this reality established by God in the created order. Thus, when we look at Leviticus 18 and 20 that address sexual purity, the foundational truth standing behind this chapter is what God declared in Genesis chapter 2. So that's the natural assumption behind the legislation given here. And so the point is that any, any sexual activity outside the covenant of heterosexual marriage is illicit and sinful. The sexual morality prescribed in these texts are still binding today. Here's how we know that's true. That's what I said. Here's how we know that's true. Here's how we here's how we know that's true, because one, the New Testament equally condemns equally condemns these perversions as well. Some of them are specifically named. If they're not specifically named, they're captured under the general New Testament term of sexual morality. I'm just reviewing what we did on Sunday morning. The, the key point is, as we think about God's holy standard of sexual purity, and, and a big point that we need to remember is, you might remember from Sunday morning, how the New Testament links sanctification, that is, Growing in Christ likeness, that's what sanctification can mean, growing in Christ likeness. And it's important for us to understand how God links that to sexual purity. And we saw several verses giving, it, giving us that, several verses showing us that link in the New Testament on Sunday morning. And then the second truth that we lifted out of that about God's holy standard of sexual purity is the fact that we don't. The Christian church can't allow culture to dictate what our opinions and beliefs are going to be in this area of sexual purity or any other area of faith and practice. And we noted that because God made several, uh, several stipulations to the people not to follow the practices that they had learned in Egypt, not to follow the practices that they were going to see in the land of Canaan when they came to the promised land. Because, because he is the Lord and they are to follow his commandments. So in review, 
the first holy standard that God revealed was, was number one, his holy standard of worship. We're to worship God. God desires our worship. We're commanded to worship. Worship is an overflow of the joy of the Spirit of God in our lives as, as a New Testament Christian. And so God reveals that in chapter 17. Secondly, we saw that God revealed his holy standard of sexual purity. And we saw that in portions of, of Leviticus 18 and 20. Now, I'll finish what we started on Sunday. The third holy standard that we see revealed here is thirdly, God reveals his holy standard of neighborly love. That's in Leviticus chapter 19. So what I want to say in regard to this, if you study the Ten Commandments, and remember on Sunday, as I pointed out in the first verse of 17, where the Bible says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, that automatically links this teaching with the teaching that God gave in Exodus at Mount Sinai. So you could really argue that what God is saying here in these chapters is commentary and expansion on the law that he was given. And so when you look at the, when you look at the Ten Commandments, Here's what we find. If you look at the Ten Commandments, there's a vertical focus in the Ten Commandments, and there's also a horizontal focus in the Ten Commandments. The vertical focus has to do with our relationship with God. If you look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, the first four commandments focus on our relationship with God. For example, commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me, focuses on our relationship with God. His, his commandment later about honoring the Sabbath and observing the Sabbath has to do with our relationship with God. And then the remaining six commandments, they have to do with our relationship with our fellow man. And so, so if you think about it, the conclusion is that first, if we're going to be, if we're going to have good, godly, peaceful relationships with our fellow man, first we have, that, we have to have that vertical relationship with God intact and in place. And so I'm taking the time to show us this because think, think about this, Jesus himself codified that vertical and horizontal focus that God gave in the, in the Ten Commandments when he was asked about the greatest commandment. Remember that? The religious leaders asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, Jesus nails down this vertical, horizontal, when he said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then he said, and the second, and the second is what? To love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus went on to say about that, on these on these two, loving God and loving your neighbor, rest the whole law and prophets. And so the conclusion from what we see, what Jesus taught is this, no genuine love for God will naturally mean no genuine love for others. So now let's turn our attention to, Ex to Leviticus 19, and you'll see that as God is laying out these laws, primarily in Leviticus 19, that relate to our relationship with one another, our neighborly love, but it also has, but it also captures that vertical focus of our relationship with God. So I'm going to read a significant portion and then talk about it, talk about it some more. So listen to what the Bible says. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. Verse 5 and following, he gives some more laws about the eating of the sacrificial peace offerings. Now, when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it and the next day, but what remains until the third day shall be burned. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an offense. It will not be accepted. Everyone who eats it will bear his iniquity, 
for he has profaned the holy thing of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. Now, I don't know exactly why God gave that stipulation. This is just my, this is just my holy speculation here. What day did Jesus, uh, Jesus arise from the dead? The third day. If the sacrifices point to Jesus Christ, which they do, so this is why this would be so offensive and uh, offensive to God, because Jesus, our Lord, was he arose from the dead on the third day. So it was permissible to eat the meat for the first two days, but not on the third day if it, if it pointed to Jesus, because he was no longer dead, he's alive. That's just my speculation. Don't know whether, don't know whether that um, bears out, but that was just my holy, holy speculation. He continues. Now look, at, now look at the laws as it relates to our fellow man, our neighborly love. Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. A quick note I want to note, I want you to see here. God frequently gives commandments in this chapter, and then he ties it to his holy nature. Notice in verse 10 how he followed that. He said, I am the Lord your God. In other words, he's ceding this authority in himself, and he's letting us know as his people that to follow his commandments is to reflect and imitate his holy character. Verse 11 and following, you shall not steal, nor deal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Look at verses 17 and following. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then, and then a couple more verses I want to show you. Uh, looking, at, looking at verse 33 and 34 in the same chapter. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be as the native among you. You shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So we can see God is revealing his holy standard of neighborly love. And I want to and I want to say this very clearly. It matters to God how we treat one another. It absolutely matters to God, especially those who call themselves followers of Christ. For us to treat others in a way that is unchristlike, we need to understand it's a reflection on God Himself. It's a reflection on Jesus, our Lord, who, sa who saved us. Because we're what? As Paul said in Romans, this is New Testament, it's the will of God. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8, 28, I believe. So it's absolutely important that we, that we demonstrate in the power of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit as the people of God, neighborly love. There again, culture is not our guide. We cannot rely on culture to form our understandings of, in, uh, of interpersonal relationships. Notice that scripture where he talked about his, his countrymen. He said, you, you shouldn't hate your countrymen in your heart. He said, furthermore, don't take vengeance. Okay, well, what does mainstream culture tell us? If somebody gets you, you've got to get them. So uh, what is it that we hear in our culture sometimes about that thing called vengeance or revenge? What? Revenge is a dish best served what? Cold. That's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches us that we as the followers of Jesus are to exhibit his holy character in our interpersonal relationships. You could turn to the letter of Peter. Peter says that Jesus was reviled and insulted, yet he didn't return those revilings and insults to other people. So it, it matters 
it matters how we treat one another, both believer and unbeliever. I want to point this out to us as well. The way we interact with unbelievers. Now, now understand this clearly. Unbelievers are not always right in their thinking. Unbelievers are certainly not right in their values as they're separated from God. But listen to this very carefully. It's very important that we keep ourselves in check through the Holy Spirit as to how we interact with unbelievers because we are directly reflecting the nature and character of Jesus to others by the way we treat them. I think it was Jesus who said in his teaching, treat others as you would have them treat you. So it's very important that we understand even here in the Old Testament, God is revealing the holy standard of neighborly love. We are at all times, in all ways, in the power of the Holy Spirit to reflect Christ-like love and neighborly love to one another. So how can we do this? How can we, how can we act in Christ-likeness? How can we make sure that we're that we're doing what God would have us to do in our interpersonal relationships and thereby reflect the holiness of God when we interact with one another. It's not like we're not ever going to have disagreements. It's not like we're ever, ever going to, not ever going to be wronged by other people. It's not like we're, we're going to be misunderstood. So how, how do we keep peace with our fellow man, how do we walk in holiness in regard to one another and, and do what the Lord is commanding us to do in our interpersonal relationships and reflect that holiness of God? Well, I want to give you four suggestions of how we can, how we can do that, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're scriptural. First of all, as we come to our, our interpersonal relationships, we need to think and focus our minds on the Word of God for our situations, okay? If we're insulted, if somebody steals from us, if somebody falsely accuses us, if somebody lies on us, if somebody, if, if somebody starts ungodly rumors and un, untrue rumors about us, what, what, how are we to handle that situation? What's to be our guide in that situation? And I'm saying to us, we need to think and focus our minds on God's Word. I believe God's Word gives us, well, I don't just believe, I know that God's Word gives us guidance on how we handle those situations. And so we, we need to make, our, we need, we need to make our, the focus of our minds as we interact with one another be on God's Word. Okay, I'm angry at thus and such. So is what I'm about to say to them, is that going to honor God or is it not going to honor God? Is it going to, is it going to build them up or is it going to tear them down? Is it, just a, is it just a way for me to just vent, um, vent anger and hatefulness to another, to another person? So we need to focus our minds on the Word of God, which means, that means we need to be a daily student of God's word that we need to, that we need to understand what God's word teaches us in in those in those uh, realms. So the first thing is as we as we um, live out the holiness of God in our interpersonal relationships, we want to think and focus our minds on the word of God for our situations. Secondly, we need to seek to be Christ honoring in all things, even when we're wrong. Does that make sense? We need to seek to be Christ honoring in all things, even when we're even when we're wrong. You've heard me say it before in different conversations, Bible studies, even behind the pulpit. There are times, there are times when it's just best to be wounded rather than right. Because being wounded would be more Christ honoring in the situation than, than proving to be right and thereby ruining ruining relationships you see as a believer the burden is on us listen closely as a believer the burden is on us to exhibit christ likeness in our personal relationships 
It doesn't mean that we become the world's doormat, but it does mean that as we interact with people, our first concern is to honor Christ. Our first concern is to act toward them in the character and love and holiness of Christ. So, so we think and focus our minds on God's word in our situations. We seek to be Christ honoring in all things, even when we're wrong. And thirdly, we're talking about how can we maintain our holy character and demonstrate the holy character of Christ in our personal relationships. Thirdly, we confess and seek restoration, especially, especially when we're the guilty party. You follow me? We confess and seek restoration. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about re restoration in interpersonal relationships. He says there in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you're at the altar presenting your gift to God, in other words, you're worshiping, you're in a posture of worship, you're, you're before the Lord. And he says, if you're at the altar there presenting your gift to God, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. You know what Jesus says? He says, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled with your brother. So, so that, that tells me that to, have, that to have animosity in our interpersonal relationships, not just with believers, but also unbelievers, to have that animosity in our interpersonal relationships is to hinder our worship. And it doesn't reflect God's holy standard of neighborly love. Paul said in Romans 12, he says, as far as, it, I'm paraphrasing, but he says there in Romans 12, he says, as far as it is concerned with you, be at peace with all men. So Paul's teaching there in Romans 12 echoes what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount to seek reconciliation. But what, what Paul is saying is you do everything absolutely possible on your end, even as a believer through the Holy Spirit, to be reconciled with other people. This, this is serious business. God is reflecting, to, he's revealing to us his holy standard of neighborly love. Did you see that in the text? Look at what he said to God's people there about how they were to treat one another. And, 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 he, and he codified it with, with the saying, I am the Lord. So fourthly, what we're talking about here right now is how we can reflect God's holy standard of neighborly love, how we make that happen in our lives. And fourthly, we need to remember our accountability is to the Lord, both in the present and for eternity. As I understand the Bible, the Bible makes it clear that there are going to be two judgments. There are going to be two judgments in the Bible. One one God outlines in Revelation chapter 20, I believe, and it's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And that is going to be a judgment of unbelievers. Listen to me closely. In that judgment, that picture that God, God gives to John of the Great White Throne Judgment, those who appear before the Great White Throne are unbelievers, and they're going to be judged according to their deeds. And we know that works cannot save us. And because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, their condemnation will be eternal separation from God in a sinner's hell. That's the great white throne judgment. It's reserved for unbelievers. Believers will not appear at the great white throne judgment recorded for us in the latter chapter of Revelation. However, if you were to look at, at the New Testament, there's also a judgment for believers. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. God reveals this through the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, and he says that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and that's for believers. Now, there's a difference between, there's a difference about what believers are going to experience at the judgment seat of Christ. When we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, our eternal destiny is not in question. In other words, Jesus is not judging us as to whether we're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's not that judgment. 
once we've been once we've been born again into the kingdom of God, Paul said in Romans 8, now therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, we've been rescued from the penalty of sin, which is separation from God. But, but at the judgment seat of Christ, the word of God makes very clear, we are going to give an account of what we've done in the name of Christ, for the cause of Christ, and in the kingdom of Christ. That's what we're going to give an account. And what I'm saying to us is, if we want to, if we want to exercise God's holy standard of neighborly love, we need to remember our accountability is to the Lord. So as a church member, uh, you're not ultimately accountable to the pastor. You're not ultimately accountable to the deacons or to the staff. Your accountability is, is with the Lord. And, and, and that should affect us in our present walk and for eternity. There is going to come a day as a believer, the Bible says that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account of the good and the bad, the Bible says, before the Lord Jesus. You know, I just, I just, that ought, that ought, to, that ought to be weighty for us. That ought, that ought to really be an eye-opener for us. That, that ought to be something that causes us pause as we live our lives, that, oh my goodness, when my days are up, when, when, the Lord, when the Lord calls me home, I am going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an accounting to him. And so I think if we'll keep these four things in mind that I've just laid out of, of how we can walk in God's holy standard of neighborly love, how, by the way, that we interact with other people, that we can reflect God's holy standard of neighborly love. I just want to review them quickly. How do we do that in our lives? Here's four suggestions. We think and focus our minds on the Word of God for our situations. Remember, the Word of God is our guide, and the Holy Spirit of God in us will help us understand God's Word and apply it in our situations. Secondly, we need to be Christ honoring in all things and all situations, even when we're wronged. The goal is to honor Jesus and to bring glory to Him. Thirdly, we're to confess and seek restoration, especially when we're the guilty party. We want to be reconciled with, with one another, especially brothers in Christ. And then, fourthly, we want to remember our accountability to the Lord both in our present walk and for eternity. Just remember, the judgment seat of Christ is there for all who claim the name of Jesus. At the end of our days, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So in, in closing, in these three chapters, God has revealed three important holy standards. The first one he revealed was his holy standard of worship. You shall worship the Lord your God and worship him only. In other words, God desires for us to worship him and he's made worship of him possible because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the Lord revealed his holy standard of sexual purity, that we, that we are to walk in sexual purity according to the word of God. And remember, in the New Testament, he links sexual purity with sanctification, that is, walking in Christ's likeness. And thirdly, what we've looked at tonight is the Lord reveals his holy standard of neighborly love. And so let us remember, let us remember what the Lord said to us in this regard. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. But as Jesus said, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord.